A reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the village and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women and children. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your words and lessons and stories, your liturgy, that are as relevant today as they ever have been. Help us understand what Jesus means when he says, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And remind us that your words and lessons and stories are, from the beginning, a promise of abundance of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When Pastor Seth emailed me this last spring, asking me if I'd be willing to give a sermon on behalf of ELCA World Hunger, I didn't hesitate in responding yes. For a couple of reasons. First, Agnus Day is, and has consistently been, one of our 100 most generous congregations to ELCA World Hunger. And any chance for me to say thank you is one I will always take. So, on behalf of the ELCA Churchwide Office and the presiding bishop, Elizabeth Eaton, I want to say thank you for your continued generosity towards ELCA World Hunger and many of our other missions. And two, Pastor Seth went to school over the border from where I sit in Pullman, and those of us who spent time out here on the Palouse tend to stick together. I think it was in that spirit of sticking together that Pastor Seth assigned me to a Sunday with one of the most iconic stories of the Bible, the story of the loaves and fishes. The story is so iconic, in fact, that it's the day one reading in this summer's Vacation Bible School. When I saw that, I thought, hey, that's great. I'll steal my notes and sermon from that. Honestly, who among us doesn't love VBS? Their snacks and crafts and singing. And then it occurred to me that while I'm exceptionally gifted at snacks, I am less talented at crafts and singing. As I looked through the materials, though, one question popped out at me. How would you have felt if you were a disciple and Jesus told you to feed the crowd with the five loaves and two fish? I imagined myself standing on a hot hillside after days, months, of faithfully and literally following the teachings and footsteps of Jesus Christ, being looked at and told, you give them something to eat. I imagine my guts would sink, my lungs tighten. I can imagine myself turning to the crowd of 5,000 men besides women and children and thinking to myself, this Jesus guy I know he's talking about. Which is a ridiculous thing to think, right? This Jesus guy, he's literally Jesus. He probably has at least some idea of what he's talking about. I imagine it's frustrating to be that disciple, standing there on that hot hillside, feeling like I have done so much and done so well, being told, you give them something to eat. It feels unfair to me. What about all that I have already done? Does that not matter? 
and 5,000 people, how can I feed so many by myself? Fair or unfair, I imagine, the disciple stomped down the hillside, mumbling to himself, this Jesus guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Jesus, of course, isn't just some guy, and he does have some idea of what he's talking about. In this case, Jesus is trying to remind this disciple the promise God has made all of us from the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis is a symphony of abundance. God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the earth, entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. This message, this symphony of abundance is echoed to, in today's psalm reading. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his compassion is over all that he has made. Throughout Genesis, we are shown that God is the breath of the world. Though our journey as humankind isn't perfectly smooth, there's the occasional destruction and floods as a matter of course correction. But we have a sense and understanding that God is abundant in love and in compassion. And in due season, he will uphold those in need. But I imagine as a disciple standing there on that hillside, that might have been hard to understand. The low murmur of the hungry crowd slowly growing to a grumble. I imagine it for me standing there after being told, you give them something to eat. The only thing I am understanding is the indomitable panic of how. The only thing I am feeling is the pressure of all the eyes looking at me. This panic, this pressure, is the manifestation of the ideology of scarcity. In Genesis, it is Pharaoh who invents the ideology of scarcity when he has a dream that seven fat cows are followed by seven gaunt cows into the Nile. Before waking in a sweat, Pharaoh dreams that the seven gaunt cows eat the seven fat. After another dream, this time about grain, but basically the same dream, Pharaoh calls in Joseph to ask him about what the dream means. And Joseph explains that seven years of abundance in Egypt will be followed by seven years of famine. Then all the abundance in Egypt will be forgotten and famine will ravage the land. For the first time, the idea of scarcity, of not enough, is had. Pharaoh, much like I imagine the disciples standing on the hillside with Jesus being told to feed 5,000 people, much like any of us who have faced the idea of scarcity, the idea of not enough, must have felt his lungs tighten with the indomitable panic. How? So Pharaoh, in accordance with the ideology of scarcity, set out to hoard away as much as he could. By the time Exodus comes around, Pharaoh is so brutal, his name is nearly synonymous with that word. Yet, he could not control the people of Israel. Pharaoh's ideology of scarcity could not overcome God's abundant love. Eventually, Exacerbated, Pharaoh tells Moses to leave and don't let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. I imagine a moment on that hot hillside where Jesus locked eyes with the disciple right after telling him to feed the 5,000. I imagine if we could somehow hear Jesus' inner monologue 
or read the intention of his expression, it would sound something like, Do you remember how God's promise of abundance of love delivered our ancestors out of Egypt? Trust in that abundance now. And I imagine the disciple looking back up at Jesus. And if we could somehow hear his inner monologue or read the intention of his expression, it would sound something like, do you remember the seven plagues? What I need, I imagine the disciple thought as he walked down the hillside, was some of that manna from heaven. That's what comes next, roughly, in our story of Pharaoh and Moses. Back in Exodus, Moses leads the mass of people out of Egypt into the wilderness. And it doesn't take long for them to realize there's no real plan here. No food to feed them all. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Hearing their cries, God rains down the literal bread from heaven. Manna. Affirming once again his promise in Genesis of a world of plenty. Here again, though, the ideology of scarcity finds its way back in, even when there are literal fields of abundance around them. The people who enjoyed the literal bread of heaven could not forget the heaviness of scarcity in Egypt. People tried to hoard the bread, the manna, hiding it away for themselves like Pharaoh did after his dream of cows. But the bread would go bad, it would spoil, it would stink. It wasn't until the community of people understood the difference between abundance and all that you could not hoard God's generosity, that they truly came together on the Sabbath. Sabbath was their acknowledgement of abundance. An acknowledgement that the every day doesn't need to be spent in a race where you're one step ahead of falling two steps behind. An acknowledgement that our community is only whole when we share in God's abundance and share in that love alongside each other. I imagine this is the part of the story Jesus wanted his disciple to remember when he said, Give them something to eat. Jesus wanted the disciple to remember what happens when we trust and live in God's abundance. I also imagine Jesus always heard when a disciple turned and mumbled something to themselves as they walked away from him. In John's version of the feeding of the 5,000, there is the added detail that the five barley loaves of bread and two fishes came from a boy here. And I imagine our disciple, the one Jesus told, you give them something to eat, walking down into the hillside, into the maw of a restless crowd, looking for a boy with a basket, with not a lot, but some bread and fish. I wonder how that conversation must have gone between the disciple and the boy. Disciple, I imagine, is boiling in a panic. Like Pharaoh, he is facing not enough. We've all been there before, I think. Some of us with food insecurity. Some of us with insecurities of other types. But I think we have all stood there facing not enough at some point in our life. I think we've all felt the crunch in our guts from the indomitable panic of how. On top of that, imagine having the long index finger of Jesus Christ pointing a bullseye between your eyes and having him say as clearly and unambiguously as possible, you give them something to eat. What do you imagine that disciple was thinking or feeling as he wandered through the now hungry crowd, looking for a boy with a basket with not a lot but some bread and fish. What happens when our not enoughs are stacked up with our hows? Not enough and how are cornerstones in the ideology of scarcity. Then there's this boy with a basket with not a lot, but some bread and fish. 
In John's version of the story, Simon Peter's brother Andrew tells Jesus about a boy who has five barley loaves and two fish. At the end of a long day, and amidst a travel crowd of thousands, this small basket of food was so out of the ordinary to the people there that Andrew remembered seeing it. I wonder how that conversation must have gone between the disciple and the boy. Because I understand that the disciple boiling in panic, scared of the scarcity. Asking a boy for his five barley loaves and two fishes because Jesus has asked it of him. I imagine the disciple standing there, just having asked the boy for his bread and fish, thinking both, even if he gives me this basket of food, it will be astronomically short of how much we need. And why would this boy give me all his food? Doesn't he need it for himself? Not enough. How? This boy, though, gives the five barley loaves of bread and two fishes to the disciple. In the middle of a sea of hungry people, this boy who has a basket of food that is so exceptionally rare that is remembered later in the day gives his only five loaves of bread and two fishes to a disciple who asks on behalf of, Egypt, of Jesus. We don't know if this is a rich boy or a poor boy. If these are his last five loaves and two fishes, or if he has a pantry full back at home. We don't know if he's a fisherman or a baker. If he was an apprentice who came out to the crowd to hear the words of Jesus. Or if he was an orphan looking for a shepherd to follow. Or if he's one of the sick Jesus healed that day. We don't know if he came from a nearby village. Or spoke the same language. Or if his hair was long or short. What we do know is the boy understood something that I myself, having inserted my feet into the sandals of the disciple of this story, struggled to remember. It is the lesson of the Israelites and manna in the wilderness. You cannot hoard God's generosity. In his abundance, there is enough. It is only when we share in that abundance that we can all sit together in God's love and Sabbath. Again, imagine myself as this disciple who is now carrying this seemingly less than abundant basket of food. I imagine that I probably still don't get it. Walking back up the hillside to Jesus, every conversation I have with myself ends in the inevitable question from Jesus Christ. How am I supposed to cut a single piece of bread up into a thousand pieces? As the disciple reached the top of the hill, less than a bundle of ba abundant basket of food under one arm, I imagine he came across a Jesus smiling broadly. Because of course Jesus understood there was already enough. Because of course Jesus understood. Because of course Jesus saw an abundant harvest in the midst of fallow ground. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. I really like that line. This is both blessed moment and picnic at a family reunion where you try to get everyone to settle down for a second so the patriarch or the matriarch of the family can say a prayer before the food is served. I wonder at what point our disciple understood what was happening. I wonder how many times he walked down the hill, into the crowd, and then back up the hill again to get more food before he began to notice the abundance the five barley loaves of bread and two fishes was transformed into. I wonder if it wasn't until he gathered up the leftovers, 12 baskets full, one for each tribe of Israel, that he understood what Jesus was trying to tell him when he said, they need not go away. You give them food. When bread is broken and shared, 
there's more than enough for everyone. This past October, I had the opportunity to travel through Tanzania and Rwanda with a member, with a group of ELCA Lutherans. Along the way, we visited with some of the people and programs and ministries that we as a church help support, along with our companion churches in those countries. We were there during the Lutheran Church of Rwanda's 25th annual Jubilee. Church that Sunday lasted five hours, but that's a story I will come back and share with you in person another day. While we were in Rwanda, we had a chance to visit with the Reverend Raphael Padilla, the Associate Executive Director of Global Mission for the ELCA. He was there for the 25th anniversary celebration as well. During our visit, one of the questions that was asked of Raphael was the bluntly honest, what can we do? I tell that short a bit of a story to give credit to Raphael for his answer, which I will give in a second, but also because this story, the feeding of the 5,000, fit Reverend Padilla's answer so well as we are shown exactly how we can find ways in our lives to answer what can we do. Reverend Padilla said there are three things that we can do as Lutherans in support of the work of the church. The first, he said, is to pray. We all pray, or should be, and if we believe in the power of prayer, then we should be praying for the people our ministries support and the people who are making those ministries possible. In today's gospel, after asking the disciple to bring him the loaves and the fishes, what was the first thing Jesus did? Taking the loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, and he blessed and broke the loaves, and he gave them to the disciples. He prayed. He gave thanks for and shared God's abundance in the world. And in that moment, as Jesus breaks bread and gives thanks, we are reminded of what we are promised in today's psalm. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, satisfying the desire of every living thing. Pray Prayers of gratitude. Affirmations of God's abundance. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance, Martin Luther reminds us. It is laying hold of his willingness. Two, Raphael said, was to participate. There are lots of ways to do that. If your congregation works with or supports a local ministry, hunger, community action, mental health, volunteer. Go see what they are about. Talk to the people who the ministry affects. When the ELCA magazines show up in your inbox, read them. Then talk about the things you've read. Tell those stories. Ask Pastor Seth what he thinks. Agnus Day has such deep roots in supporting ELCA world hunger. Participating, understanding, and learning more is your chance to enrich in and grow the great works you are already doing. We can find no better example of participate than the disciple in our story today. When Jesus said, you give them something to eat, our disciple walked into the crowd, found food, brought it back. And when after Jesus breaks bread, he helps take the food back into the crowd all, and feeds the people, all 5,000 of them. And then he has to help gather up the leftovers, 12 baskets full. There's a lot of chances for us to participate when Jesus asks us to. Third, and finally, Reverend Padilla said, was to provide. This congregation gets that. This congregation understands what it means to provide. It is part of who you are. And again, I thank you for your continued generosity and spirit and belief in God's abundance. In the feeding of the 5,000, in John's version, it was a boy who gave what seemed like a simple gift of five loaves and two fishes. A boy, a simple gift. If you're so compelled to give right now as to sit at your computer, and if you are so compelled to give right now as you sit at your computer, I would say pause this video or open up another tab or grab your phone and go to goodgifts.elca.org. 
After my time in Tanzania, I really like the goats. If in your prayerful heart you want to talk more and more deeply about ELC or world hunger and how you might provide in ways beyond what you see in good gifts, then I say please send me an email or give me a call. If you haven't figured it out by now, I love to talk, especially about our ministry work around hunger. Pray, participate, provide. If not enough and how are two cornerstones of the ideology of scarcity, then pray, participate, provide are the three legs on God's stool of abundance. In the world of pray, participate, provide, when bread is broken and shared, there is more than enough for everyone. So how would you have felt if you were a disciple of Jesus and he told you to feed the crowd with the five loaves and the two fish? That was the question from Vacation Bible School. Honestly, I would have definitely thought, where are we going to find that food out here in the middle of the desert? And there's no way we can find that much food. How? Not enough. The truth is, this challenge hasn't gone away. It is a challenge that God will always put in front of us as we are all disciples of Jesus. They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Even before this COVID pandemic, hunger was on the rise. And as a result, our church was responding with more resources. Now the United Nations World Food Program warns the pandemic could almost double acute food insecurity by the end of this year. In the coming months, as many as 265 million people could suffer hunger extreme enough to endanger their lives or livelihoods. Virus-linked hunger is leading to the death of 10,000 more children a month. Further, more than 550,000 additional children each month are being inflicted by wasting, malnutrition that manifests in spindly limbs and distended bellies. Over a year, that will be another 6.7 million permanently damaged children on top of the 47 million children we can already expect based on last year's total. The world, during this COVID, the world during this COVID pandemic has sometimes felt like Pharaoh's dream with the seven gaunt cows eating the flesh of the world whole. There is a rising tide of hunger in front of us and a decline and resources nipping at our heels. How? Not enough. Jesus said to them, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, we have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And all ate and were filled. And they took what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. When bread and bro is broken and shared, there is more than enough for everyone. Let us pray. Abundant God, we thank you for your loaves and fishes. Help us remember that we are called to live in your abundance, and there are many ways we can be a part of living out that promise in the world. Remind us that our prayers and participation help lift up and advance the ministries of our church. And by providing loaves and fishes, we are trusting that when bread is broken and shared in Jesus' name, there is more than enough for everyone. In your name we pray. Amen.